Hey everybody, thanks for joining White Dog Outdoors. This is the time of year when our Salmon River videos tend to get a lot of attention and you guys have been asking a lot of questions lately. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of questions about how I actually rig up for salmon fishing and how I kind of target the fish to try to get them to bite. So, we're going to be heading up this week actually and I need to get my stuff ready. Figured it'd be a good time to kind of go through my setup and then kind of also just kind of the way it is up there. And if you do want a chance of catching fish that bite, my recommendations on kind of how to do that. So we've mentioned in some of our recent videos that when we get to 3,000 subscribers, we're going to be doing three giveaways. We're at around 2,800 subscribers right now, and uh, we're closing in on that 3,000 mark pretty quickly. So we're going to hit it pretty fast here. But when we get to 3,000, we're going to be giving away three prizes. We're going to give away the White Dog Snapback Hat. We're going to give away the White Dog Winter Carhartt Hat and then we're going to be giving away a dozen flies. So in order to take, take part in that giveaway, you need to be a subscriber on the channel. I hope you guys consider subscribing to the channel and joining us for all of our adventures. And when we get to 3,000, we'll announce the giveaway. By the way, as we're going through this stuff, I'm going to leave links in the description to kind of as much information as I can. I'm going to describe as many things as I can in the description below, especially the leader setup. And then any materials I use, you'll be able to see what I use down in the description as well. So it's going to get a little complicated sometimes as we go through these things, but I'm going to try to provide as much information down below as possible. So let's hit a few things right up front. Anytime you talk salmon fishing in the Salmon River, things tend to get a little controversial. So there's one side with pretty strong opinions that the fish don't bite. And then there's the other side with pretty strong opinions that they do bite. Um, I'll tell you that I think both are right in certain situations. And I think if you want to be able to catch fish that actually bit, that you need to put yourself in the right situation. I want to dispel a few other rumors right up front. Like even in my own videos, a lot of people will say, oh, you're just flossing those fish. And those people are not wrong also. Um, I am getting bites, but I'm also flossing by accident. So I try to create my setup so that I don't floss those fish. And I'll show you guys what that's going to be and how we can minimize those things. But you're catching 20 pound, 25 pound salmon in a river and even though I can't see them, they're there and sometimes they're stacked, man. I mean, they're just like, they're in there thick, right? There's no way you're not going to foul some of these fish. There's no way you're not going to floss some of these fish. I don't ever claim that, but what I'm trying to do is key on the ones that will bite and try to get active bites, right? So I don't care if I hook 70 fish. If I land a couple that I actually got to bite, that's where it's at for me. Okay, so when the salmon come into the river, they're there for one purpose. They're there to spawn and die. It's what their body is programmed to do. In fact, when they come into the rivers, usually their stomachs are shrunk up and they're not processing food. So they're not there to eat. But you're not necessarily trying to get them to eat. You're trying to get them to bite. And eating and biting are two different things, right? So these salmon are out swimming the Great Lakes or even the, the ocean if you're out in the, on the Pacific, uh, on the West Coast and they're the top predator, right? They are chasing bait fish and they're aggressive, they're mean, right? Now bring these fish, spawning season, into the rivers in a confined space and they're, they're all cramped together. The aggression triggers, the instinct triggers. They're very territorial and aggressive fish. So when something comes by them, whether it's a salmon or something smaller, a lot of times they're not eating, but they're chomping, they're aggressive, they're they're competing, and so you, you can't take the instinct out of them, right? So they're used to chasing, they're used to biting. Um, it's kind of what they do. So you're gonna key on a lot of those things. So I think you put yourself in the right situations, you can take advantage of that. So if you want a chance of catching a fish that actually bites, there's a few things I think that are really important. Number one, I think the lower you fish in the river, the better in general. Um, when those fish are coming in, they're coming in m very fresh and much more aggressive. They haven't been pressured yet, and if you can get to those fish before they've been pressured and before they've been in the river for too long, you have a much better chance of catching fish that actually bit. Um, I've had most of my success in those situations where you're catching them early and they're still fresh. The other key really is that those fish haven't been pressured yet. Like, so they're fresh to the river, so they're more aggressive in general. They're not tired, they're not tired from like going upstream, but they haven't been pressured. I think one of the big keys, and even if you're not low in the river, if you're fishing elsewhere in the river, one of the big keys is finding fish that are not pressured. If those fish 
have been running the gauntlet and they've got sinkers coming down in front of their face and they're getting foul hooked left and right, there's no way that that fish is going to bite. You have to find fish that are not feeling that way, right? These fish are not going to bite in those kinds of situations. So unfortunately, a lot of the river is like that. So I just think if you put yourself in those situations, you're not going to have success trying to actually get a bite around a lot of other people who are not trying to get a bite. Um, so I would just say, put yourself in the right situations, okay? The first time I ever came to the river, I was brought to the main river by some folks and I was basically taught that the fish were not going to bite and that I had to lift them. And, you know, I kind of wanted to try to do it different, but in the main river, it was impossible. I, there's no way I was going to fish and try to get a bite in that kind of situation. It's, just, it's not going to happen very often. Um, so I was taught to lift and you know what? It was actually a great trip. It was, it was, it was really getting my feet wet, understanding what it was like up there. I don't regret it at all. And I think a lot of people experience that. After that first trip, I came back and I kind of thought about it and I wanted to do it different. I wanted to be able to see if I could find fish that would bite and I didn't care about hooking up 70 times a day. I wanted to see that one fish who would actually go after my bait and bite it, right? And so that's really kind of what I focused on. And one of my buddies brought me up there and he actually brought me to the upper river but we keyed in in another area where um, spawning fish get very aggressive. So when you have a lot of males competing for a female, um, they kind of get a little disregard for everything else around them. And as long as they haven't been foul hooked and stuff like that, you know, just recently, they, they will get aggressive. You know, they're, they're chomping at each other as they're swimming by each other and com competing for the female. So when my first ever take from a salmon was in that exact situation, it was in the tail out of a pool, and there was all these males competing for a female, and I swung a big egg sucking leech in front of them, and the first one, one came right out and chomped at it, and he swiped and missed. He didn't actually eat it. And then a couple of casts later, I did it again, swimming right through, and he came out and he actually ate it, and I set the hook, and I unfortunately didn't land him, I was using too light a line at the time, but uh, it just showed me it was the a really pivotal moment for me where it showed me that these fish truly can bite in the right situations. Okay, so fresh to the river, unpressured, and if they're aggressive, keying on aggression, especially when they're competing against their salmon or especially during, this, during the actual spawning. Since that trip where I actually saw the salmon bite, I've, I've put all my efforts in my time at the Salmon River into trying to get biting salmon and I've learned a lot along the way. If you see some of my earlier videos, I clearly wasn't understanding everything that was going on. And um, but the last several years, I think I've really come to understand, you know, how flossing works. And and even though I thought I was getting bites in some situations, the video clearly shows by the placement of the hook that I wasn't. So one of the things you you won't you won't ever really know if that fish bit unless you saw it actually move and bite, right? And I've seen that. I've seen fish come and take my bait. I've seen fish move six feet to get to my fly and eat it. Um, so I've seen those things, but most of the time you're not gonna know if that fish actually bit. You, what you're trying to do is detect and feel the strike, but that strike could be the bite or it could be the line coming tight on the fish and then that fish giving a head shake. So you don't really know. The biggest indicator I can tell you is once you land a fish, is what's the placement of that hook? Is that hook going from the outside of the mouth to the inside of the mouth? So like did the line catch it and floss across and catch it that way? That's an indicator that that fish was flossed, right? If the fly is actually on the inside of the mouth and the hook is going to the outside of the mouth, most likely that fish bit and you felt it. And then when you set the hook, you, you set it. And a lot of times I'll find them right in the corner of the mouth, but in the inside to the outside. And that's a real indication of whether or not that fish bit. Do I know 100% for sure? No, I don't. Never going to claim I do. Um, but I'm pretty sure those fish are biting, and I've definitely absolutely seen evidence that they're biting in some cases. So I would say if you want to do it, be willing to put in the effort, be willing to put in the, um, the work to find active fish, and plan your trip accordingly so that you can try to find fish that might be more aggressive. Okay, so what's my setup for these guys? So first of all, um, I focus pretty much on fly fishing. I don't actually usually spin fish for these guys at all. In fact, I don't think I've ever spin fished for a salmon. Um, I fly fish only, so this is gonna be specific to fly fishing, but your basic rod is going to be a nine, probably like a nine foot, nine weight. You could drop down to an eight weight, but I've seen people bust eight weights. Um, so 
I say it's basic because, you know, with a nine foot rod, you're not getting a lot of reach. I like a rod that has a little more reach. This is what I used for years. This is nothing special in terms of the rod. It's just a cheap nine foot nine weight that I got years ago. I think one of the important things when you're matching these up is going to be the reel. Um, these are monster fish. They're going to pull like crazy and you are going to ride your drag hardcore with these fish. Um, you're going to be using your drag a lot. A good reel with a good drag is going to be really important. I got a couple older reels here that are L.L. Bean Shearwaters. They don't make those anymore. They're pretty good. This one here is a Reddington Rise. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't really care what the what the reel is. Make sure it balances the rod as much as possible. It's going to get pretty heavy holding a big rod every all day. The more balanced it is, the better it's going to feel. And it needs to be able to have that drag um, that's going to at least attempt to slow that fish down. Sometimes you can't slow them down at all. That's just going to happen. Um, and that's pretty awesome, too. But... Um, Make sure you got plenty of backing on here. Make sure you have good knots attaching your fly line to your backing. The worst thing you can do is have your fly line out your reel pretty quick. You're into your backing and have something break, and there goes your entire fly line. Make sure that is really well connected, okay? Um, but uh, this is the most basic setup that I have. Um, I like, again, a longer rod. So when I fish... I'm pretty much euro nymphing for these guys. So basically, I'm keeping a straight line, a tight line, and I'm feeling everything as much as possible. So a longer rod is going to give me a much, much better reach to be able to cover a lot of the, a lot of, a lot of water. Okay. Um, this here is a Reddington Duali. Um, this is an 11 and a half foot rod. It is an eight weight. Um, this is. I think probably a perfect rod for uh, for the king salmon and the cohos too. Um, definitely sizable enough that it's going to be able to handle. So when you get a longer rod, not only can you get a better reach on these fish, um, you're going to be able to handle the fish a lot better. You've got much longer and softer tip on these rods. It's going to help protect your line, and it's going to help wear that fish down a little bit more. You're going to have a little more leverage on that fish than you would with a shorter, stiffer rod. Um, so I definitely love these. So again, this is the Reddington Duali. This is the eight weight switch. It's 11 and a half feet. Um, again, this is matched up with my L.L. Bean Shearwater. Can't get those anymore, but doesn't, doesn't matter. Any reel that has like a good, a good drag system on it. For these, I use a Reddington switch line. I want one that's got a longer taper. I don't like the short tapers. I used to have a short taper. I hated it. It was good for throwing an indicator a short distance, but after that, you couldn't do anything. So if I wanted to not necessarily drift with these rods, but I actually wanted to swing, I can I can easily th do roll casts and, and modified spay casts and throw this thing out there and let it swing across the current and, and try to get some, some salmon that way. Um, really, really versatile rods. Love the switch rods. I would highly recommend them. Um, and then I do the same thing for steelhead as long as we're on it. Um, this is a little bit older rod. This is again a Reddington. This is a CPX. This is a seven weight. It's about, I think it's 11.4, 11 foot four inch, um, 11.3. It's 11 foot three inch. Again, it's matched up with a shear water. Um, again, these things really help control the fish well. This is my steely setup. I love it too. Um, but I love those longer rods when it comes to fighting these big fish, for sure. All right, so there's a few main ways of kind of fly fishing for salmon. Uh, one is drifting, which is basically what I do. I'm, I'm, I'm using a little bit of weight, and I'm basically trying to drift my fly along the bottom where the salmon are and get a reaction to get a bite. Um, another method is swinging. Um, I will do this on occasion, um, but a lot of people like to do that. They use typically a longer rod, like a space style rod, and they're, they're chucking their line across the current like this and letting it swing across, and they're using you know some different kinds of fly streamer type things um, to get a reaction from that, that as it comes across in, in front of a salmon. A lot of times they'll, they'll react and bite that way. So you see a lot of guys that'll swing. It takes a lot more room to be able to swing. So not easy to do on the salmon river in a lot of cases um but i have seen it done pretty successfully probably mostly lower river and then um i don't see this hardly at all but the guys who use skein um it's basically an egg sack under under an indicator um and those guys um when they get bites man those 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 egg sacks are way down in the throat those the salmon are engulfing those so i think those are probably the three main ways at least in terms of fly gear um like i said i don't do the other two i haven't done skein at all i do a little bit of swinging once in a while because i have my switch rods um and that's if i'm not getting anything on drifting i try to do a little swinging um, but mostly I'm, I'm i'm doing what they call drifting and i'm not using an indicator so 
I'm basically a urine and fing. I want to talk a little bit. If you don't know what urine and fing is, kind of take a look. If you're a if trout fisherman and you're a fly fisherman, definitely recommend urine and fing. I have done a lot of it in the last four years or so, and my God, it is absolutely ridiculous. Um, but it's an incredibly effective way to fish. Here, here are the basics of urine and fing. You want to use heavy flies. And I want to use as little weight on the line as possible. When I'm actually year on for trout, there's never any weight on my line. It's all in the flies. Always. And you want to try to keep a straight line from the tip of your rod all the way down to your fly. And you want to keep the weight, you want to keep the flies right along the bottom going as slow as possible. Okay. Current, current on the top is going to go much faster. And you don't want a float or anything pulling the, the fly along too fast. It's not going to be along the bottom. It's going to lift up. Okay. Um, so you use a lot of weight in the fly itself. You keep a straight line. You use thinner line from a section basically down to the fly. And that causes less current to be able to hit it. It's not as thick. It doesn't pull as much. And you're basically just trying to use that weight. And really, it's almost like bottom bouncing. But you're keeping a really tight line. And it's a mostly a short distance kind of thing. Okay, That's how I fish. Um, so my setup is set specifically for that. Okay, Now... You'll see a lot of guys out there that are doing something similar. But here, so here's the regs. The regs say wait no further than four feet from your fly, no less than one feet from your, from your, from your fly. And uh, I think there needs to be a line break even between the weight and the fly so that it can't slide up. And that might be only a DSR regulation. I'm not sure if that's a DEC regulation. But one foot to four feet. Now, if you're a four foot and you got a lot of weight here in your fly, is four feet away you're basically letting your line come across the bottom of the um of the river and that's where the salmon are hanging most of the time and so what's happening is the the line's coming across the salmon's mouth and you're basically flossing those fish so that's where i accidentally floss sometimes i'm not intending to but you can't see them and it just kind of happens sometimes what i do to minimize that is i go with a much shorter leader i go with usually about 18 inches from my weight to my fly and what that's doing is it's it's not keeping it's not I'm not bringing it across the current and, and basically lining or flossing those fish. It will happen on occasion, but I'm trying to keep a tight line and I'm using as little weight as possible on my line itself. And I put all the weight in the fly and that allows me to keep a tight line, which is straight up and down and not across the current. If I'm going across the current, that's what I'm going to floss. If I'm going straight up and down, I'm much less likely to foul or floss any fish still happens but a lot less and i'll just give you guys a little bit to illustrate this um last year first day i was using the same setup i was using 20 pound line those fish came in they were fresh they were aggressive i had a good number of fish in the area that i was fishing and i was getting bites pretty regularly um pretty regularly throughout the day um with 20 pound line and i was getting really good hookups the placement of the hooks was good they were from the inside of the mouth to the outside of the mouth for the most part and the next day I had the same conditions, but those fish were a little more pressured. They'd seen a few more anglers the second day. They had probably been in the river a day longer. And I thought I was going to have a great day again. And I started fishing. Those same fish or maybe different fish were there, but it was the same number of fish that were in the same spots. I didn't get any hookups. Like, so if that doesn't tell you I'm fishing the exact same one day and I'm hooking up all over the place. And the next day I'm fishing the exact same way but I'm not hooking up at all. I'm not, I'm not following, I'm not flossing, I'm not getting bites. That tells you, that tells me anyway, that when I'm fishing and I'm fishing the same way, if I'm not getting a bite, that tells me I'm not following and flossing those fish anywhere near as much. And if I feel something, it's more likely to be an actual bite. I can drift through a stack of fish this way and I can tell when I'm getting a bite. And when I don't get a bite, it goes right through. I lift it slowly out. And I'm not following fish for the most part this way. Even when I can see them there, I'm not following these fish. It'll drift right through without, without really getting caught. Um, so I, I really think that by feeling that and learning that, what it's like to fish those fish in those situations and not get the bites, and then have the days where you do get the bites, it's definitely a different level of activity from the fish, and it's not something that I'm doing different. So I do have a lot of confidence that I'm getting a significant number of bites when I'm out there. All right, now the leader is actually going to be really important. I hand time my leaders to make them exactly the way that I want. This section is going to get a little more complicated, um, so I'll try to break it down as much as I can. So first I'll say 
The leader is going to be a different length depending on the type of rod that you have. If you have a shorter rod, you're probably going to have a slightly shorter leader. If you have a longer rod, like a switch rod, you're probably going to have a little bit longer leader. Okay. For the switch rod that I use, 11 and a half foot, um, these are the basically the, the lengths in, in the setup. From the fly line, I'm going to have about 10 to 11 feet of 20 pound either monofilament or fluorocarbon. This section is not going in the water. This is going to be held above the water by the, by the rod. I'm, not, I'm never laying my line down in the water unless I'm swinging. And when I'm drifting, I'm holding the rod up high and that line, that section of line is not going to touch the water. All right, so section one, main line, 20 pound fluorocarbon or, um, or monofilament. I think a lot of times I use the real Floriflex or Floriflex Plus. Um, it's a fluorocarbon uh, tippet material. Then I'm going to use a triple surgeon's knot. I'm going to use a triple surgeon's knot for every piece that I tie here, okay? But from the main line, section two is going to be a high visibility um, monofilament that's going to allow me to watch what's going on at the end of my rod, okay? So this is amnesia, right? So this is Amnesia. This is a 20 pound monofilament line. It's super high visibility. I have it in the fluorescent yellow and the red. Okay. Um, so these are great for being able to see what's going on with your line. As you, if you know you're anything at all, you know that there's that sighting material and that allows you to see what's going on. So if a fish hits, you're gonna see the, the bump or the pause, anything that's a little bit different, they teach you to set the hook, okay? I basically do the same thing. Although to be completely honest, I'm keeping such a tight line that the line doesn't really tell me much. I feel pretty much everything, okay? Section one, main line, 20 pound fluorocarbon or mono down to about a three foot section of the high visibility sighting material. So we'll call that section two. So my section two is the sighter material. Then I get down to the line that's actually gonna be going into the water. So everything else so far is being held above the water line. Now I use a section to tip it. This is gonna change depending on the depth of the water and potentially the type of water that you're fishing. Okay, if you're fishing a slower pool, you might have to downsize the, the, um, the weight of the line. If you're fishing faster water, you can get away with heavier line. Last year in my Salmon River, I think it was September Salmon videos, uh, part one and two, I was using 20 pound tippet. I didn't have to go any lighter. The fish were aggressive. That was day one. Day two, they were completely different. I definitely had to drop down and I think I was down to 16 or 15 pound line on day two um, to be in order to be able to get bites, but it's still pretty heavy, right? So that's a, that's a section usually about five to six feet. So section three is my tippet um, of about um, five to six feet. And again, the weight is gonna be dependent on what the water conditions are, okay? Then I'll tie on my last piece of tippet, we'll call it section four, and this is gonna go um, to the fly, okay? So first of all, when I tie this last piece, I want to keep a tag end of probably three, probably four inches or so, maybe even a little bit longer. And that tag end is where I'm going to put any split shot that I need. Okay. Now I'm not putting much split shot on. I am putting the absolute minimum amount of split shot that's going to get my fly down to where I need it to be. Okay. Um, a lot of times either I might not be using any split shot if I'm in slower water. And a lot of times all I need is those little smallest BB size split shot to get it down. Okay. Sometimes in faster water, I need to put on more. And if I need to put on more, I need to put on more. But the idea is I want that going as slowly along the bottom as possible in enough weight that I can keep and maintain a feel of what's going on in that fly. Okay. Um, and then again, 18 inches. Now that 18 inches is going to help keep me from accidentally fouling and flossing fish. Okay. Um, so that's basically the entire length. That's the entire setup of the leader. Um, try to break it down as easily as possible, but that last, you know, two sections, the part that's actually underwater, these are the parts that you're going to change depending on the water conditions and the depth of the water and everything. So, um, again, I've gone as heavy as 20 right to the fly and I've gone as light as maybe 12 down to the fly. Okay. All right. So I know some of that setup was a little complicated, um, but 
I'm, I'm going to describe as much of that down below in the description. So I'm going to detail out how I set my leader and how I do everything. I'm going to leave links to the materials below, the things that I use. I'll leave links to the you know rod and reel setups and all that stuff so you guys can kind of see what those look like as well. But, you know, I really appreciate your time. I, I know that when you talk salmon fishing, things can get a little controversial sometimes. But, um, you know, I think it all depends on putting yourself in the right positions and the right places and situations where you can actually get a bite and then trying to fish a certain way to be able to trigger and get that bite. So it can definitely be done successfully if you want to go out and catch fish that actually bite. It will be a lot harder though so be prepared i would love for people to be able to go out and do this and, and learn and and see how this can be done so if you have stories definitely let me know leave a comment down below i'd love to hear that kind of stuff i love that stuff all the time anytime somebody learns something i love that so anyway i appreciate the time thanks for joining us if you guys like what you do definitely subscribe really appreciate it and good luck this year we'll guys we'll see you guys soon